today a lot of research from my PhD that I have completed. Some of it is still in process. And um, I also present a bit um, of side projects and new thoughts that have been coming up over the last couple of weeks. And the main theme is climate change impacts on marine ecosystems and the consequences for fisheries management. And all this research wouldn't have been possible with a lot of people and funding. So my amazing supervisory team and also um, my committee, friends, collaborators and colleagues and important data and funding from various institutions and organizations. So today I would like to take you on an about 40 minute journey. I guess that depends on how fast I will speak. I will try to pace myself. And it's a journey across scales, ranging from global to regional to more local scale. And the route of today's journey has seven stops. So I will start with a brief history of climate impact sciences to get everyone up to speed and on the same page. Then I'll tell you a bit about ensemble modeling and the FISH framework, which played a key role in my PhD research and it still does. At our third pit stop, I will zoom out and present results on a global study on marine ecosystem responses to 21st century climate change, and then move to a regional study um, on ecosystem responses across ocean basins and end the journey across scales with our local study on fisheries management consequences um, in, a changing, in a changing climate um, based in the Northwest Atlantic with a case study uh, using the Northwest Atlantic Fisheries Organization. And lastly, I want to share some rather new thoughts on um, using those climate change um, research results um, and to communicate them more effectively to like decision making or policymakers. And so that has been an ongoing and interesting challenge. I would love to hopefully spur some interesting discussion uh, based on those thoughts on I will share. Okay, so my timer didn't start. So I stop me if this talk is too long. Well, uh, Let's start with this brief history of climate change science. Here, some information will be old news for some of you, or it might be a useful reminder that we've actually been addressing this issue of climate change for a very long time, or it might even be um, entirely new information for some, some of you as well. So climate change is the long-term alteration in Earth's climate and the average weather pattern. And it actually took a long time to convince the, the vast majority of the scientific community, and probably beyond that community, that human activity can alter the climate of our entire planet. So in the 1800s, um, experiments suggested that actually human produced CO2 and other gases could collect in the atmosphere and then insulate the, the earth. So that, would, that was the start of the global warming theory. And then by the late 1950s, actual CO2 readings um, corroborated this global warming theory. And these readings are shown in this graph to the right. So this one, which is the Keeling curve. So here, these are high accuracy measurements of atmospheric CO2. It's measured monthly and it still is. And it was initiated by Charles David Keeling, if someone wants to look him up. And it's the master time series that documents cha the changing composition of our atmosphere. And that curve has an iconic status in climate change science because it actually provides the evidence of the effect of human activities on the global atmosphere. And it's also essentially a record of our burning of fossil fuels. So eventually, with the help of a lot of data and climate modeling, it was shown that, not, that global warming was real also uh, represented by this line here. This is from the Show Your Stripes um, initiative. And that just shows the average global Earth's surface temperature. And it, that's observation that shows that it is getting hotter. But based on this data and modeling, we were also able to actually attribute um, climate change and the, the impacts and implications towards humankind, which is important for 
eventual action and mitigation. Okay. So in climate change science, we use scenarios, projections um, of future climate to explicitly investigate potential impacts of anthropogenic climate change. And uh, typically those are pathways, scenarios or targets that capture, for example, relationships between human choices, emissions and temperature changes. And some, one, two of those pro prominent um, scenarios of, um, are the represent, representative concentration pathways, RCPs, and the shared socioeconomic pathways. Um, in the past, we've used a lot, we focused a lot on the RCPs, which are scenarios that include time series of emissions um, of uh, greenhouse gases, such as CO2, and, and other active gases, as well as land use and land cover. Now the focus seems to shift a bit more on the SSPs, um, which are um, pathways that describe alternative futures of socioeconomic development. And in combination, as shown in this graph, here they are com combined with the RCPs. They're used as a more comprehensive, maybe even holistic scenario that could provide a useful integrative frame for climate impact and as well policy analysis. In my research, I've mostly used RCPs. So remember that name, it will come up quite, a, quite a, um, often. So climate scenarios are, um, they rely upon modeling. Um, and the evolution of those models over the recent decades has been uh, possible due to considerable increase in computational capacity. And um, it's evolved from basic atmospheric models uh, developed in the 1960s, early 1970s, and um, evolved to more um, expansive general circulation models, climate system models, with, and eventually led to the development of um, Earth system models that include explicit representation of chemical and biochemical cycles. So these are also, these are coupled complex models that couple ocean dynamics and also atmospheric dynamics. And um, those ESMs are models I um, will talk more about. So again, remember um, that name and I will talk a bit more about what they actually are in a bit. And um, yeah, well, sticking to modeling, I'll already come to the, the approach of ensemble modeling and the fishnet framework, which as I said, was a cornerstone. Both of them are actually cornerstones of my um, recent research. And FishMIP is the fisheries and marine ecosystem model into comparison project. And it's an international initiative that brings together regional and global marine ecosystem models to um, help understand potential changes in marine ecosystems and fisheries under 21st climate change. So why do we use, why do we need a fish map? Um, well, there are, I think, multiple reasons. So climate change is already affecting and is also projected to continue to affect the oceans throughout the 21st century. So for example, um, water temperatures are increasing, ocean acidification is projected to increase their, uh, the, um, frequency of extreme events are projected to increase as well as um, ocean deoxygenation. The patterns are, are different on a global and compared to regional scales, but those impacts are being observed and are projected to continue. So in response, marine ecosystems or species um, are changing. So for example, some species are changing their range shifts to find maybe um, more suitable thermal ranges Primal production is impacted. In some regions it's increasing or decreasing. And um, well, connected to the rain shift, species are so migrating or into new areas. Um, shell building organisms have trouble building their shells due to acidification. And there are even size reductions in some species due to metabolic constraints. And all those responses also affect fisheries. So for example, in terms of fisheries yields and fishing costs, and that highlights the wider socioeconomic consequences of climate change. So this is all a complex system. And to be able to understand how the system might 
respond on various scales to climate change. We need um, models and a lot, um, I guess a lot of models. And this is where I come to um, the ensemble modeling approach. Um, so, and it's it started as far as I know with the coupled model intercomparison project. And this is the coordinated model intercomparison of uh, current and future impacts um, of physical and biochemical models. And so for example, here in the upper panel, this is an example of ESM, so the Earth system models that are part of CMIP of sea surface temperature throughout the 21st century. And those are then combined into, um, into an ensemble because, and this is possible because all the different models are actually forced with the standardized climate change scenarios. And because we can then combine them into this ensemble scenario, we can estimate mean future trends and associated uncertainties. And this um, general framework of model intercomparing and ensemble modeling has become the gold standard in climate science generally, but has only recently, fairly recently, been developed or initiated through FishMIP for the ocean. So the advantage here is that through combining different marine ecosystem models, we can capture a broader representation of ecosystem dynamics than any individual model with just one specific set of assumptions. So ultimately, um, a MIP in general, but also fish MIP, we can systematically highlight the uncertainty associated with different model structures and assumptions. And this can, for one, um, spur model improvement and model development, and that's always ongoing. But it can also improve the capacity to convey the limitations, any advice on future states of marine ecosystems and fisheries. Um, yeah. And I think that's a, one of the main advantages of a fish map here. Okay, so I just wanna give a bit more an insight into the data that I used in the results I'm gonna to present today and, and some of the main um, analysis I did. So in my research, I used this fish map uh, projections from six global marine ecosystem models. So those six models were forced by standardized input provided by two earth system models or ESMs, which would be this, and then they're forced. Um, and under four different RCPs. And then in the end, the FishMIP models gave a standardized output. Uh, for example, of total marine animal biomass um, or biomass of different size classes. And I want to stress that here, those projected changes are just under climate change only. So the fishing effect on biomass levels was not uh, considered. So we only highlight the, the climate signal. Um, and then I combine those individual model projections into an ensemble model mean based on a model democracy. So that means each model is considered equal. And most um, explored relative temporal and spatial changes. So this would be an example of the temporal relative change and, and spatial change. And then we'll actually talk about this results, these specific results in shortly. So what do I mean with relative change? So we had we explored percent change relative to the mean of the 1990s, and we use that as a historical reference period. And we used relative rather than absolute biomass changes because um, the different ecosystem models within the ensemble, they cover different components of the marine ecosystem. So for example, some models cover specific size classes, others trophic groups, others are species specific. So in the end, their absolute biomass estimates are not directly comparable. So some of the main analyses were um, to look into um, the variability and the agreement of those individual projections as well. So that would be the part of the model intercomparison or the MIP. Um, and I used the intermodel standard deviation um, as a measure of variability in the magnitude of projected relative biomass changes around the ensemble mean. So that would be the, the shading around the mean. 
And another measure was um, the model agreement, which I personally like because it's simple to communicate and fairly straightforward. So this is essentially the variability in the direction of projected changes. So how many models in the ensembles are just agreeing in the, in the direction of the change. And um, throughout my project, we assumed that um, between 75 to 100% of, um, of the models, they agree that represents a high model agreement in the ensemble projection. Okay, so with this, I'm coming to more specific results. And um, I start with the synthesis of the global fishnet models where we analyzed and compared the global um, projections of total um, animal binary on the global scale. So again, we have the reference period. So all changes are relative to the 1990s. And these results highlight that global marine animal biomass will decline under all future emission scenarios, which are the different colors here. And overall, those, um, those uh, patterns are driven by um, largely by warming temperatures and declining primal production. Declines uh, under RCP 8.5 about, are about a third, um, of three times stronger than, um, for example, the RCP 2.6, the, the blue line, and um, which would be the scenario if you would actually follow the Paris Agreement. Um, so it actually highlights uh, the benefits to be gained from climate change mitigation, just looking at that um, graph. And then to, I want to just zoom into the RCP 8.5 and just show you how those models actually are differ. So overall, most of them are actually showing, they are agreeing in the direction of the change. There is quite a considerable spread in the magnitude, but um, overall just um, the ensemble mean projection, we can almost be a bit <laughs> confident in those as they are projecting the same direction. I will talk a bit more about uh, uncertainty, um, which we need to consider too in, the, in those projections in the following slides. Okay, so spatially, um, ocean regions uh, responded a bit differently. Um, so there was a strong increase in total animal biomass in polar regions here and there, and a widespread decline in temperate to tropical regions under RCP 8.5. Those patterns were similar qualitatively under RCP 2.6, but less pronounced. Um, and those results actually corroborate um, other studies that warming waters and enhanced primer production are expected to facilitate species expansions or biomass increases towards the poles, while tropical areas uh, might experience pronounced species losses um, because of, for example, thermal thresholds are exceeded. So how did the models agreed on a spatial scale? Well, overall, there was a high model agreement on the direction of change in many ocean regions. So these are the dark blue regions, but there are also a lot of regions where it's quite low, especially along the coast or um, also towards the poles again. Nevertheless, those uh, results that provide confidence in the FishMap multi-model mean um, that combine different ecosystem structures and processes. Another main takeaway from that paper was uh, trophic amplification of marine biomass declines across RCPs, which are here, um, highlighting the potential food web changes due to climate change impacts on marine ecosystems. And so, such an amplification of, clim uh, of climate change that goes from primary reproducers, so that would be NPP, so net primary production, and phytoplankton here. Um, to higher tropic levels, so zooplankton and, and higher tropic levels, they vary among the, the ESMs and the ecosystem models. So some of the, the factors uh, would include that there are changes in phytoplankton size composition um, or a change in the food chain length. There's a reduced trophic efficiency or maybe higher metabolic costs with increased body size. So I think this result actually highlights how uh, climate change impacts on the ecosystem can translate to 
upper tropic levels and then eventually impact uh, fisheries. Okay. So moving from the global patterns to more regional patterns. With regional, I mean ocean basins here. So here I use the, the fish map ensemble to understand potential future changes across ocean basins. So why is it important to go onto that scale? Well, climate change is affecting oceanographic and biologic, biological dynamics on multiple temporal and spatial scales, as I just showed you. And rates of change in marine ecosystem structure and functioning are expected to differ between ocean basins. And so now, how these changes may actually play out among ocean basins over the 21st century remains fairly unclear. So that was the aim of the study, to fill a bit of the knowledge gaps here to start to, to understand what kind of potential changes might happen across ocean basins. So this is one of the main figures of the paper, and it shows the relative change through the 1990s again of total animal biomass, which is the red line, of net primary production, which is the green line, and surface sea surface temperature, which is the black line, under the high emission scenarios. So in general, I, I will focus in the results I'm presenting on the RCP 8.5, also for time reasons. So what we see is that under high emission scenario, uh, total animal biomass is decreasing by an ensemble mean of 15 to 30 percent in the Atlantic Ocean, South um, and North Pacific and the Indian Ocean. But biomasses are projected to increase by 20 to 80 percent in the poles, um, so Arctic and, and Southern Ocean. But here the, there's high model uncertainty and variability. And those biomass projections were highly correlated with changes in net primary production. So the green line here, it's, it's very striking in some of the um, ocean basins more than in others, um, which has to do um, with uh, model configurations and how the, uh, the ESM information is translated into some of the, the marine ecosystem models. And it's correlated to uh, sea surface temperature as well. So negatively correlated. Overall, those changes, again, were similar under RCP 2.6, but less pronounced. OK, so I want to focus a bit on the Arctic Ocean, because it's the, the obvious outlier. And I can talk a bit more about the different model structures and uncertainties. So these are time series of individual model projections of all those models for each model run with each ESM and for each um, emission scenario. So the major increase here under both of those RCPs in animal biomass can partly be explained by the only species distribution model in the ensemble. And this model um, models species specific habitats for commercial fish and invertebrates only. So that means in the 1990s, which is our historical reference period, that model only has a few commercial species with a relatively low biomass in the Arctic. So if there's any newly invading commercial species coming into the region and they're increasing in growth because of uh, favorable habitat, that results in a large proportional change in biomass. So in contrast, um, all other ecosystem models, can someone please mute themselves? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, therefore, so in contrast, all these ecosystem models, no, sorry, the other ecosystem models, they project more bulk changes in marine animal biomass across, for example, different size classes, functional and tropical groups due to changes in environmental factors. So sea surface temperature or MPP, for example. And, and those are affecting metabolic rates, energy transfer or trophic relationships of both commercial and non-commercial species. So therefore, those other models, they, their uh, start biomass is generally higher in the polar ocean, meaning that proportional changes in the future are lower. So that explains this, partly this pattern. Um, there are other reasons I will um, reveal later in some other results. Okay, so going a bit deeper into the intercomparison, 
Um, so we wanted to further understand the, um, the different projections in different ocean basins. So we compare the relative variability or the, the spread of the projections of total marine animal biomass to the variability attributed to the Earth system models here and attributed to the marine ecosystem models under both emission scenarios. And we found a similar variability across most of the ocean basins. And again, the Arctic Ocean, I guess that's not a surprise, is an outlier here. Um, so the variability in the ecosystem models were, was 40 to 70 percent higher compared to the Earth system models. Again, as I explained, likely due to the different model configurations, but there's also a general um, lack of data still in the Arctic that can be fed into uh, the models. Um, so the representation is, is not as good. And um, the Earth system model um, representation of coastal dynamics and coastal, specifically coastal and Arctic dynamics is not well resolved. And that translates directly also into the marine ecosystems. And another reason is for the Arctic and probably should be more for the Southern Ocean, our sea ice dynamics, there's only a fraction of the models in the ensemble or even in the, within the ESMs that are um, capturing those dynamics as well, which drive a lot of dynamics in the, in the Arctic. Okay. So, uh, that's our next stop. We're moving a little more local to Canada and the Northwest Atlantic Ocean. And I uh, will present some results of a study focusing on all Canada's three oceans. And here we use Canada as a case study of a rapidly changing northern latitude country. And it's actually the first study that uses an ensemble model approach for the Canadian Ocean. And the second study, our uh, results I will present are, uh, we move a bit closer, so the Northwest Atlantic Ocean, where the context of fisheries management comes a bit more into play. So this is, uh, again, the fish MIP ensemble, um, total animal biomass changes at the end of the 21st century relative to the 1990s under the high emission scenario. And here the Arctic, Specifically, the archipelago is projected to experience biomass increases, whereas the Pacific and large regions of the Atlantic are projected to experience declines. Um, again, under RCP 2.6, it was all a bit dampened, which highlights again that we need to implement uh, effective mitigation policies and actions. Um, well, looking at those results, though, it is important to interpret them, um, because we're also moving more uh, into a smaller scale, to interpret them in the context of the projection variability and model agreement or the overall uncertainty. So here I mapped the intermodal standard deviation and um, it's, it was really high in the archipelago. I explained a lot of reasons why, but specifically here, because we, we could see it a bit more, um, there's another reason the ensemble actually which it was still six models um, within those islands in the archipelago, only two models within the ensemble were able to project biomass changes. So that influences the results a lot. Um, that was not the case in the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean where the, the model spread was quite low. And um, that general pattern is a bit, um, well, the confidence in those projections is a bit reflected in, in the model agreement. So high model agreement in the Atlantic and parts of the, the Pacific and generally low in the Arctic. So when I'm writing up those results or presenting the results, um, I ask myself and people ask myself what we actually can do with those results if there's so much uncertainty. Um, well, for one, they're useful to just to depict large scale patterns which um, are always good to know, potential patterns at least. Um, but they can also, they're valuable to pinpoint where to target model improvement efforts. So there's clearly a lot to do for Arctic models, um, Earth system models and ecosystem models likewise. But I think also, and I think that counts for all the, the results I've presented, it can start an important conversation about what ocean we want in the future.
Okay, so here I zoomed even more in to the Northwest Atlantic um, and combined um, those future model projections um, or not combined, but uh, put them in relation to the NAFO regulatory area, which is a fisheries management body here that is responsible for most offshore um, fisheries and manages them in collaboration with, with DFO as well. So we were interested in how projected changes in harvestable biomass may affect the fisheries production in that area. So here we use the model uh, projections of biomass larger than 10%, which acted as a proxy for harvestable biomass. And overall, spatially by the 2090s, um, most of the NAFO convention area below the 60 degree north were projected to experience large biomass decreases, which peak declines here in the sub area three, while biomass in the, in the northern NAFO areas were projected to increase. That's a pattern that by now I am familiar. But then uh, by analyzing uh, the relationship between historical fisheries landings pro um, provided by NAFO um, data and projected biomass changes. So here we have the landings and here the changes, the projected changes. We tuned into potential consequences for fisheries production under different climate change scenarios. So overall, we found a strong relationship between areas of projected future declines in harvestable biomass and historically important fishing grounds. So this is especially like sub area three again. And um, another relationship was that there was a less, um, well, in a less pronounced, no, oh, sorry, I lost the track. So in the Arctic and the subarctic divisions, uh, where they, we have a lower historical landings, those areas were projected to experience um, biomass increases. So this study can um, point towards potential consequences for management bodies. It can really inform specific like stock assessments or, or seasonal or um, short-term management actions, but it can focus a bit on the long-term um, focus we need to have to actually adapt fisheries to, to climate change. So we also, in that context, we also looked at, again, NPP and um, SSG, so in net primary production and sea surface temperature under RCP 2.6, so the high, mit uh, the high mitigation, so low emission scenario, and RCP 8.5. And essentially with, um, increasing water temperatures and increasing emissions, net prime production is projected to, to decrease by five to 25% across almost all NAFO divisions. And this is important because uh, prime production is, is, as I think most of us know here, the fundamental building block of marine ecosystem production. So, and this is what fisheries depend on. So again, I have to, there are uncertainties, but as I just mentioned, it can give us, um, an idea of what we might need to prepare for. Okay, so moving on from the data heavy maps and um, graphs, um, I also uh, did an extensive review of key aspects in fisheries policies and legislation um, when it comes to climate change adaptation. And I, especially the last project I just presented led me to, to asking that question, so how as our nations um, integrating climate change adaptation efforts, um, and if they are, um, how? And I, I did a literature review of nine case studies, um, which is actually currently in revision. So I'm busy revising this. I'm adding more case studies as, a, as a, I get more information and based on review or comments, of course. Um, but I want to share some of the results um, with a focus on Canada. So this is one of the, the main ta summary table, which summarizes the key aspects of federal fisheries policies and legislation. And I also, I wanted to know what kind of management approaches and tools are being implemented and whether um, in the, the specific legislation or policy, um, whether ecosystems um, are considered, whether 
for example, is an ecosystem-based fisheries management approach uh, being implemented or considered? I also wanted to know uh, whether climate change is explicitly integrated in decision-making, stock assessments, and explicitly mentioned uh, or acknowledged in the specific policy or legislation. So for Canada, which just fairly recently amended their Fisheries Act, um, they to, to actually include a little a bit again more ecosystem um, consideration um, and accountability, they are using various management approaches and tools, such as um, total allowable catch, but also right-based fisheries, also known as turfs, um, or time area closures. So in Canada, for some stocks, the EBFM approach, so the ecosystem-based fisheries management approach, is generally, it's, you know, it's considered for some fisheries, not for all. So that would be this year. And climate change is not is considered um, in decision making, especially in the in the Pacific salmon management, but largely it's not. But there has been a recent uh, proposal for a climate change. So a risk-based decision framework, which explicitly considers climate change when it comes to, for example, stock assessments. But largely um, there's no um, explicit integration of climate change into stock assessments and it was climate change was not or is not um, explicitly acknowledged in um, the Fisheries Act itself. So that actually represents a general pattern across most of the case studies. So most mandate in the ecosystem approach. Um, there is a general progress of formal climate informed decision making, which I find promising. Um, but overall, traditional single species stock assessments and traditional reference points are still dominating. It is a it's a difficult uh, field to to uh, adapt to adjust to climate change, and I know a lot of people are working on it. So I'm 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 curious to see what's going to happen in the next couple of years. Okay, so based on this large review. I um, came up with a set of recommendations. And again, they are under revision. So the ones I'm presenting are the original ones and I would love to hear um, your thoughts. Um, but essentially, so based on the policies and legislation, but also what we know about the climate change impacts on the ecosystem and the fisheries across the case studies, I came up with the following. So we need, to develop explicit climate change adaptation objectives in the policy and legislation to enhance political will and accountability. We need to manage fish stocks with climate enhanced um, EBFM approach. Ideally, it should be scaled to the respective fishery and ecosystem. And this is important because climate change is not affecting species in isolation from each other, but rather the entire ecosystem, uh, which would require, again, enhanced um, of climate informed stock assessment, but also enhanced routine monitoring. And we would also need an overall paradigm shift in management objectives towards uh, objectives for ecological and economic sustainability and equity um, in the long term and away from short term economic profits. Lastly, um, as the stocks shift, a lot of them are already shifting in distribution in response to changing ocean conditions, there is a need for new or strengthened multilateral agreements um, or institutions. And I think we can learn from some examples that are already happening. So the, for example, there's the collapse of the agreement of the Atlantic macro between Europe, the EU and non-member states, where now the stock is actually being overfished for a couple of years because um, they've changed the distribution and the agreement doesn't really work anymore. But then again, there are other agreements uh, which are until now working quite well, which could act um, as a success example and um, being maybe extrapolated under a climate change scenario. Okay, so that was my presentation about my results that, um, of the, my past projects and current projects. And now I hope I have still enough time I, I want to share some thoughts on the, the applicability and communication of climate change results. So this has been one of the main challenges in my research. Um, 
to, to actually make it relevant and ideally applicable for real life purposes. It is uh, challenging because climate change science can be complicated and often drowns in limitations and uncertainty. And those are important to account for and, and communicate, um, especially in, in such a new um, pro initiative as FishMIP. It's, it's essentially a baby MIP uh, compared to CMIP, which has been going on and comparing and improving for a long time. But in general, we often forget that there is a strong scientific consensus that global warming is impacting the earth, the oceans in specific ways. Um, and I think we can actually uh, mobilize that consensus to communicate our results in a, in a different way. And in that context, I wanna highlight two interrelated issues. So to be able to actually get things done to adapt, we need to change the decision-making process. They needs to be able to make decisions despite of a rapidly changing world and uncertain trajectories. And that's closely related to how we are communicating our research to those people in power. So climate change adaptation presents a complex challenge for decision makers. It calls for decision making um, with potential very long-term consequences, which, which can be uh, based on incomplete knowledge or uncertain information about future changes. And that's something decision makers uh, are often reluctant to do. Um, and that's, I think, it's also reflected in some of the results in my, in my literature review, where a lot of the, the policies and decision making is, is lacking behind a bit in, in adapting. So the reasons behind this could be, I think, um, the judgment of the information is incomplete, blurred, inaccurate, unreliable, inconclusive, or potentially false. And that conception um, might relate to, not only, to the common uncertainty focused narrative when it comes to presenting climate impact results. Um, and I mean, I've, I've had a very uncertainty focused narrative in my presentation today. And it makes sense because, as I said, FishMap is new and we, still, we are still. Um, improving the models and still learning a lot. And this is why we need to have a strong uncertainty uh, narrative. But as we progress, I think it's important to start to think about how we can use that knowledge we are gaining throughout this whole process and how we should maybe communicate it in ways that is very accessible to decision makers. So there are different ways. So one is the one I mostly use today, that would be the probabilistic approach. As I said, it's important, important to have consistent and transparent treatment of uncertainty. And this is also how like the, the big intergovernmental panel of climate change, who does the big climate reports, um, um, acts or operates. But uh, I see a shift slowly uh, away, a shift from like this uncertainty narrative, even in the IPCC, towards a more a risk-based um, or storyline narrative. And there are two, I don't know if that's the IPCC that uses those specific approaches I'm gonna present, but I found two I found interesting I wanted to share. So one is the storyline approach. So this is a climate risk narrative or story about possible futures. And it's ideally co-produced between stakeholders and narratives. So based on those storylines, we can actually still represent uncertainty in the physical aspects, for example, of climate change. It can improve risk awareness by framing risk in an event-oriented rather probabilistic manner. And that actually is more relatable to more um, to people and how we perceive and respond to risk rather than communicating in uncertainty terms. And using those approach, we can strengthen decision-making, uh, particularly because it allows to work backwards from a particular uh, decision point, for example. So it's, it's a bit similar to a scenario planning. Um, and by doing that also um, bound, boundaries of plausibility can be explored, which could guard against false precision and surprises. So related to that, so, and I mentioned it, it's the shift from uncertainty to risk narrative, and that includes the language we are using. So instead of talking about the novel and abstract uncertainties in global models, um, which is still predominantly the, the way. Um, some people or 
there is there are voices that uh, propose to use familiar language, for example, of insurance, health, and national security sectors. And the difference is here that the, the issue is framed about risk rather than a set of predictions, and it turns the problem into something that most people are used to dealing with. So again, it's more relatable. And I think if I would be a decision maker and it's very more relatable, maybe I would actually do something quicker, depending on the election cycle, maybe. So just an example of the difference of the languages um, we could use. So presenting climate impacts, that's what I just did in the last 40 minutes, I guess. Um, Corner and Al, they propose to say, for example, as the earth warms, there's more moisture in the air, which increases the chances of intense rainfall. So this flood is consistent with what scientists have long been predicting. So this mobilizes the scientific consensus and heavily relies still on, on the scientific knowledge. Um, so Corner but also says that don't say no single weather event can be attributed to climate change. And I think it is quite apparent where um, actions might actually happen uh, and where not, um, depending on what we actually say in that particular example. Okay, so with this, we are actually coming to the final step in our journey, the conclusion. So first I thought to provide a summary slide, recapturing the main points the traditional way. Then I, decided to provide you almost maybe as a treat at the final destination with a word cloud. So a word cloud that actually summarizes the main issues in relation to climate change. Not all of them are relevant for the oceans or fisheries, but they are re relevant for humans and the environment we're living in. And humans usually value oceans or nature and humans are us, so scientists and fishermen and women policymakers. So I think this cloud actually summarizes the main uh, points I've been reiterating um, in this presentation. And um, I leave you with this and uh, say thank you and hope for a good discussion.